on the Empath Hollywood Bureau, please visit empathcollywoodbureau.org. Established in 2021 by Empath, the Muslim House stands as a dedicated space to elevate American Muslim voices at events such as the Sunday Dance Film Festival, South by Southwest, and Tribeca. It serves as a platform for vital discussions that hold significance for American Muslim communities, such as the one we're about to have today. We are deeply grateful to the Dual Student Foundation for their support in uplifting Muslim voices in the arts through the Building the Gist program and for their generous grant to help elevate our work at the festivals. Today's event is in partnership with the Foundation. Our sincerest gratitude goes to the leadership and the staff of the Dual Student Foundation whose hard work and dedication have made this event possible. Please give them a hand. Woo! moment in our history with prevailing events both here and abroad and a world that seems to regretfully surprise us every day. It's natural to wonder about the true progress of American Muslims that we've made in the last two decades. However, hope never dies as we are promised by God in the Quran that he will not put a burden on us that we cannot bear. We may or may not see the fruits of our sweat, but as we continue to build, future generations will reap the benefits, just like we have built on the work of past generations before us. Despite the current setbacks, the critical mass within the creative community and elsewhere is significant and will serve as a springboard for profound change moving forward. I have no doubt. What now, recalibrating the roadmap to manifesting the dream, is a panel discussion of hope and optimism. Moderated by Doris Duke's Foundation, Zegar Rahman, please give her a hand. <laughs> the panel includes acclaimed journalist, Mandy Hassan. Filmmaker yeah. and producer, Uzma Hassan, no relationship. <laughs> It's my honor to introduce Zeko Rahman, the director of the Doris Duke Foundation's Building Bridges Program. Through her leadership, the program has become a vital platform for amplifying the voices of American Muslims and celebrating our diverse heritage. The implementation of Zeba's vision for the program has been years in the making. That God's timing is always best, and timing has never been so good to receive her support of our work. Thank you, God, and thank you, Zeba. And without further ado, Zeba Rahman. Thank you, Sue. We're delighted to co-host uh, MPAC's Muslim House with you. Salam, friends. On behalf of the Dara Street Foundation, a warm welcome to each of you here today. Here's some background about us as a foundation. Our mission is to build more creative, equitable, and sustainable futures by investing in artists and the performing arts, environmental conservation, Medical research, but no animal testing. Doris Duke loved animals. Child well-being. And greater mutual understanding amongst diverse communities. And that's where the Building Bridges Program comes in. The program's mission, the Building Bridges Program's mission, is to elevate US Muslim stories to increase mutual understanding and well-being among diverse populations to build stronger and more inclusive communities. And what we did this year, which Sue was referring to, is that we launched a three-year initiative, a new initiative, which is titled Accelerating the U.S. Muslim Storytelling. And MPAC, MPAC's Hollywood Bureau, to be precise, 
is one of four inaugural grantees. Our grant supports their build out of the Muslim house, houses, I should say, meeting spaces at prominent entertainment industry house throughout the US. And this is going to be um, in effect for the next three years. So we started this year at the Sundance Festival in January. We hope you've enjoyed the wonderful Palestinian food that Tariq Dabka and <laughs> Thank you so much for so much deliciousness. We need it so badly. <laughs> and now it's time for our panel. As Sue said, the title is What Now? What Now? Recalibrating the Roadmap to Manifest the Dream. And we're really excited because we have three panelists, three great storytellers, quite distinct, quite different, who bring their own unique perspective to the story. Their bios are long, their achievements are great. I'm going to try and abbreviate and share with you um, a smaller version of what they've done. And then I'll invite them up on stage. So, I'll start with Ariane. Ariane is an Emmy and Tony Award nominated Iranian American actor, Ariane Mouyan, to is his whole name. And he is also a writer and a director who's created the Emmy nominated thriller The Accident of the Wolf, among many other projects. And He's writing an autobiography about his family's escape from Iran after the 1979 Islamic Revolution. He's also civic-minded. He co-founded Waterwell about 20 years ago. It's an award-winning community organizing art and education company that has created for these two decades or more socially conscious uh, programming and productions. And one of the ways in which they do that is that they embed with large systemic institutions such as the New York City Public Schools and the New York City uh, court system. Um, and then Ariane went and produced a film about the performances that took place in New York City courts. So I'm really not sure when Ariane gets to sleep. <laughs> but I would advise him to take a lesson from the pinstrap penguins who sleep a thousand times a day. They do micro sleeps. I actually do do that. I sleep little deeper than that. I'm a penguin. He's got animal. one starting in about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's my is a film producer and creative leader known for bringing unheard stories to global audiences. Her latest feature film, Creature, was directed by Academy Award winning Asif Kapadia in 2023. It features the groundbreaking, genre-busting collaboration with the extraordinary choreographer Akram Khan. Her documentary work has included the moving film Flying Paper. It chronicles the kite making and kite flying tradition in Hussein. Additionally, Usman has created a wide ranging executive career within organizations that have a vision for transforming culture through the creative industries. She was the first person of color to serve on the board of England's Channel 4. She's currently board chair for London's Bush Theatre, a multi-award winning new writing theatre whose mission is to disrupt the canon. She has a subversive side to her. Her work for independent productions and studios has crossed four continents, including Focus Features and the Tribeca Film Festival. And this brings me to Mehdi Hassan. No relative of Usma's, as Sue has made plain, Mehdi is a true all-around troublemaker. <laughs> He's an award-winning uh, broadcaster and best-selling author. In fact, those green bags on your chairs contain Mehdi's book, that each one is specially signed for you. 
to be taken away from us. He came in order to, to do the signing today. He, in his current avatar, he's the founder of the media platform Zotero. Am I pronouncing this correctly? Yes, you are. Zotero, for independent and unfiltered journalism. So needed. Zotero, which comes from the ancient Greek word for seeking out and striving, is a new media organization that seeks answers to questions that really matter. Always striving for the truth. He's a columnist for the Guardian US, one of my father's favorite papers. He's a frequent political commentator and has previously hosted his own show on MSNBC, as many of you know. He's been a podcaster at The Intercept, for which he launched the podcast Deconstructed and was a presenter for Al Jazeera English. His op-eds have appeared in numerous media platforms, including the New York Times and the Washington Post. So with this, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ariane, Usma, and Nidhi. Now what? Calibrating the roadmap to manifest the dream. My question to each one of you is, have you ever had a now what moment in your life? And what did that actually mean you to do? Anyway, um, hello everyone. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you Zebra for having us. Um, I've had a couple, I've had a few, I think. Uh, one that sticks out from a few years ago was the morning after the 2016 election, I think, was a now what moment for me. Uh, I had just moved to the US. I assumed I would be covering the Hillary Clinton presidency. Um, I just realized at that moment, you know, I, I, that was a moment, a now what moment, where as a journalist, I had to question everything that I believed. Like, what is the point of what we do? If this person can win in this context, what does anything matter to do? I remember turning to a colleague of mine and saying, we should just check it all in and just go be accountants. <laughs> Not only wrong being accountant, but what are we doing here in this field? What is the point if we can't get through a big chunk of the population with fake news and believes any nonsense? So that was a moment. I mean, more recently, I guess, uh, I was in New York on November 29th last year. I was doing the Daily Show, which is always fun, um, with Michelle Wolf, who was then guest hosting before they had brought John Stewart back. And I remember driving back late night because I had my show the next day, so I had to be back in DC. I uh, drove back home at like 2 o'clock in the morning, woke up, and then somebody called and said, we're cancelling your shows. And I was like, oh, now what? I think that was a now what moment. And I think I was quite quick in realising, no, I was upset for a while because the show's cancelled, but I was quite quick in thinking, well, I'm going to go then. Uh, I don't think I can stay. To be fair to MSNBC, they said, you can stay and be a guest anchor and be on air hours. And that was a moment for me to say, but that's not what I want to do. That's not why I'm in media. I'm not there to tick a box or make money or be a big, you know, great name of organization is to have a platform and have a voice. So for me, the now what moment is literally, okay, I'm leaving, but what do I do? Right? Do I go work for someone else? Do I go back to previous employers? Do I try and find another place? And very quickly I've settled upon, I won't say when, but very quickly I've settled upon, I think I'm going to go do my own thing. And that was a now what positive, unlike the Trump now what moment, which was deeply depressing and we're still in that moment, because he's coming back very soon. Um, the now what moment, but this is a non-political event that I'm speaking for myself, not for the Doris Duke Foundation, let's say. God help us from that narcissist criminal racist. Um, in the now what moment with my job was actually a positive one, because I'm in a place now where I'm actually very happy with the now what, where I ended up. And that doesn't always happen, but for me several months later, I'm like, well, this is where I was supposed to be. And the immodest, uh, megalomaniacal person in me says, yeah, this was what I needed to do, and if not now, when, if not me, who, and I just wanted to do it. So that was enough. That was that worked out. I hope. That's enough to do. Good job. 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 Good job.
Go ahead. Me? Okay. Um, hello, thank you, uh, George Duke Foundation and, <laughs> and the fire department. Um, man, the now what of it all, I feel, is so powerful of a question, actually, because there's micro now what's, and there's massive, there's like macro now what's. Throughout my, as you're asking this question and, and what was happening, um, we were meeting before this, I was thinking about all these little mini now what's, and one of the mini now what's was, um, that is a four, that's a four, that's a five alarm fire. <laughs> um, the now what that I remember distinctly is um, this company that I co-founded 20 years ago named Waterwell. Um, that is a community organizing production and, 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 and education hub that's been going around doing this kind of work before it was popular for 21 years. Um, I remember I did a show, we did a show called The Persians um, in 2005, and then I got a rave review from the New York Times, and then I got asked by a major agency to come in and see if they wanted to represent me. Major agency, I had no business going with these folks. And as I was walking to that um, place, it, dawned on me that they're probably going to ask me to do a lot of terrorist roles. And, and it really was all split second now what? It's like, oh, right, they want me to do terrorist roles. Oh, man. And then, I, and, then, and then very early on in those early meetings, I just said to them, listen, I escaped, my family escaped Iran. We have no business being here. It's all a miracle. Everything right now is a cherry on top. Um, I cannot play terrorists, and I cannot play victims. And really what happened is I didn't work in film and TV. <laughs> because there are no roles at the time without those two narratives. Um, so, um, and I dedicated my life. I gave also in those same meetings, I said, and this my company at this moment was three years old. I said, also, you have to represent Waterwell. And they're kind of like, well, I don't know what this guy's talking about. Um, but they did. Um, and so those little micro now what's of just um, trying to make sure that, and really it was just a, a fear that I would be misrepresenting a people that didn't have a voice with all these other folks that pretended that, that they know a voice. And, and really, I'm so glad that you're doing this yourself, Many, because um, one of the pleasures and one of the scariest things that I've done is start this company 20 or one years ago. But I have to say, it's given me agency and it's given me control, and it's also let me not have um, um, gatekeepers dictate how we want to make the art that we want to make. So that's a micro now what. I'm also going through a now what right now as the world is going crazy and stuff is happening with the Department of Education in our school and. All these things are happening. So the now what's really are constant and and, and, and and small and big. I'm sure you did not think that you were going to get canceled. I mean, no one, no, honestly, none of us thought that you were going to get canceled in a weird way. And so um, you just constantly have to make those now what's, you know, at the forefront of your mind and just keep pushing through in a way. So. Thank you. Thank you, Zimba and Sue, for having us. Um, um, I think you're so right about the, big, the macro and the micro now what's. My, my big now what really emanated from this city. Um, uh, I, I started off my career fresh out of grad school as a, as a PR consultant working for a big corporate agency for policy. And, you know, I was climbing the corporate ladder and doing the thing that you do. And um, I was at an awards ceremony uh, on September 11th. Um, surrounded by colleagues who were getting very, very, very drunk. And um, I saw in the corner um, a television screen, the security guard was watching the footage of a plane going to tower. And um, that moment for me really was such a life-changing moment. And the now what really was, it made me understand um, being a lover of words and a lover of images, how powerful images can be. And I think I knew somehow in that moment that that image of the plane going into the tower would change the world forever. So it, it, it made me quit my job and, and, and apply to go to grad school and, and go into a completely different path of becoming a filmmaker, becoming a storyteller, because I wanted to somehow recapture 
different types of images that we could use to talk about our community. And, um, and then the micro now what's are constant, um, but I think it comes from, uh, I feel very lucky to have those micro now what's because if you're not part of the mainstream or part of an infrastructure that is uh, where you're automatically supported, you're, you have to be both strategic and resilient at all times. Yeah. And those micro now what's are actually exercising that muscle of strategy and resilience and thinking, okay, if not this road, then which road? If not that way, then which way? Um, so, yeah, I find myself doing that all the time and very much in a, in a moment of that right now, thinking, how can I use the uh, knowledge that I have gained and uh, the contacts that I have to, to try and move the conversation on? Um, from where it is, and I, I've been very lucky, even just today, but over the, over the past couple of weeks, just meeting so many amazing young Muslim fi uh, filmmakers, um, just to bring it back to the new generation. And I think, I think now it's time for us to um, try and help them uh, inhabit a different world. Thank you. Let's continue on with this thought. Um, could you give me as a South Asian Muslim woman? How have you managed to navigate? I mean, there's so many barriers. You're such a pioneer. You've been in spaces that are exclusively uh, white, and uh, you've managed to, uh, you know, rise, rise to the very top. How, how have you managed? And, um, how have you managed to make your difference work for you? That's the yeah, I think you have to. Um, I, have, I think just to contextualize, starting out in any sort of media sort of 15, 20 years ago when I did was incredibly different. And I think one of the things that I learned from a very, very young age um, was to speak, speak different languages because I knew that not everyone would be able to understand the language that I had in my heart and soul. Um, so, I was talking to Zebra about this story the other day, and maybe many might understand. I, I, I grew up in um, South London, a place called Croydon, and I certainly didn't speak like this when, when I, um, uh, you know, as I was growing up. Um, and I remember going to a private all-girls school when I was 11, and thinking to myself, I have to change the way I speak if I'm going to be taken seriously. And, and I did that in a very specific way. And I think, again, it's that thing of having to understand that you are, you are on the margin. And, and if you're going to turn that into a superpower, you have to learn how to connect to and understand um, other people who are maybe not as used to having to understand you. Um, I found it like the greatest joy and privilege and darkest challenge of my life, trying to survive in these spaces. Um, but I guess I'm lucky enough to have found something that I love to do so much that um, regardless of how hard it is, I, I somehow always uh, want to try and find a way. Um, so, so I guess uh, I guess it's pretty, it feels, it feels like Thing. I think I think now with identity and I, I never it, I never really labeled myself South Asian Muslim all of those things it, it's only as I you know through the years I realized that that part of my identity sort of was a threat for everything I was doing all the stories I was telling and the way I was moving through the world which I think is, is powerful I think now in a time where identity is first and foremost and people are so uh, aware and maybe a bit happier and clearer about their identity, the challenge is slightly different. I spend a lot of time trying to fit into the mainstream and I think, um, I feel like the newer generation is, is perhaps uh, less concerned with that, which, which I, uh, I really want. And that's progress. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, I uh, just turned to you now. Was when it talked about uh, the the two poles, you know, and having yeah. to uh, navigate them uh, and then find it. I mean, strategic actually yeah. as a, a a very uh, tenacious eleven year old who was not going to give up. She was going to uh, find a way to get through to these other eleven year old girls in, in what was probably this snooty uh, school. Um, you used to navigate. Oh yeah. Um, well, when we came to the states, Iran, um, you know, was in the midst of the Iran Contra situation. It was a few years after um, the hostage situation. The Ayatollah was like the most hated person on earth. I mean, everything was just so crazy. And my family came here with no English skills and no idea what how to even make the next steps happen. I mean, the chances that I'm even speaking to you right now are so miraculous as every one of my family is still in Iran outside of my immediate family. Um, but the reality is that um, with older brothers and a sister, I was told uh, very quickly that being Iranian was scary and it's a scary society to be an Iranian. And the, the, the mechanism of what they did to teach me was to say, try as quickly as you can to become American, as fast as you humanly can. And, and, and I understand that now. Um, I'm disappointed by that now, um, but I understand it. And, and, and we were just talking earlier, the wheels of progress do move slowly, and it's a fader, it's not a light switch. So I understand what needs to happen in those ways. Yeah, I, I mean, part of what's happening to our societies and our cultures and um, is that it's been overtaken by uh, um, people that don't know anything about us. And so then they are the ones that are the, the gatekeepers of media. When the movie um, Not Without My Daughter came out in 1989, 1990, um, and I mean this really, really seriously, that for Iranians and Iranian males, that was a nail in the coffin. That every single time that I dated anybody, they would be, have you ever seen the movie Not Without My Daughter? It's like, yeah, dude, no, I'm not taking your wife back to Iran. <laughs> I mean, your, your daughter back to Iran. Um, and so, so, and those micro cuts um, add up to a lot of bleeding, and um, so you navigating that is really, really tricky. One thing that I will just say that's a benefit of, of probably all of our families is that they don't let us forget who we are or where we came from. Um, and um, no matter what, my parents always said that we were Iranian first and foremost. Um, in a time where people were calling ourselves Persian, um, my family was like, nope, you say Iranian. And so I think that the people, every person in this room that's an other um, is probably a kind individual that no one knows anything about that other. And so um, part of what we have to do is constantly just tell them how we are and who we are. And that's tricky in a place where people want to like box us into categories, but that's what we have to do, and that's what we'll continue to do, I think. Well, that's a perfect segue to you, Maggie. Um, and my question for you is, is there a personal incident that you can recall that made you decide that you wanted to start telling stories in the way you do as you do? I mean, I have, like many people in this room, I have the similar story. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And I have a similar story to this one in the sense that, obviously, even though I was in the UK, like this one, that 9 11 moment, I was um, 22 years old. I was in my first or second job in, in British television. I think we're all the same age when we discovered Aaron slightly younger than us, so I don't like him anymore. Um, I was a huge fan of you until today, and I found that here. Um, we're talking a couple months. But okay. <laughs> um, and I think that for me was a moment where obviously I then became the kind of Muslim interpreter in any room I was in. Where I was like, what do you think? Uh, and it wasn't even, what do you think as in a good way, like, what do you think? It was like, are you going to judge us? 
Is this bad? Like I, the number of times I was in newsrooms where people said, "Can we put this out? Can we play the Azaz music in the background for our package?" I was like, "Please don't do that." Um, but that would happen a lot. I went to Sky News. I went to the BBC for that entire 10, 15 year period after 9/11, and then we had the 7/7 bombings in London, which was our 9/11 in 2005, which in many ways was worse than 9/11 because it was homegrown. It was British. It could have been me. It was someone born and brought up in the United Kingdom, not foreigners from uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Um, so. Those moments obviously forced me into positions. I was already in the media, I was already interested, but I had to become kind of geopolitical. My interest was British politics. I was this nerd who was obsessed with British parliamentary politics. I was, that's what I wanted to do. And then after 9-11, I became you know, the expert on the Taliban and all those things, and you know, I embraced it. Today, you know, I spent 20 years covering this stuff. But actually, I, I always remember one moment when I, nothing to do with news. I remember I was working at Channel 4, that was, was on the board of it before, but back, back in 2000, I don't know what year it was, Six, seven, I want to say, um, and it was when they did the Undercover Mosque shit series. It was a very famous shit with the Undercover. All the Muslims were protesting outside the building. British Muslims protested Channel Four because they thought that it was a sensationalist documentary that made them look bad. And I had just joined. It was like my first week, and I was this young, like super junior editor. I remember the head of Channel Four uh, at the time. I think his name was Julian Bellamy, and he called me into his office. I was a junior editor with a bunch of us, and he said, "You're Muslim." What do you think we should be doing? It's a 24 year old, no knowledge of it, actually, has no right to be asked that question apart from that. My last name is Hassan. And what do you think we should be doing? And he was like, you know, we've done the Hajj coverage, and no one gives us credit for Channel 4's Hajj coverage. And we've done, you know, Channel 4 News, we cover Middle East fairly than, more fair than anyone else. And I said, you're missing the point. I said, it's not about news and current affairs. Actually, Harry and I were talking about this just a moment ago about we're normal people. And my favorite line always is Ben Affleck's line to Bill Maher, which is, we just want to go to, go to school and eat sandwiches, yeah. right? That is, for me, fundamentally, we're talking about representation. It's not about do we do more or less than the least coverage, do we do fairer or less fairer? It's normality. Are we, do we get to be normal people? And I remember saying, and as well, we'll get to from the UK. Channel 4 at that time was famous for two things. It was famous for food cooking shows, and it was famous for property porn. It was famous for house hunting shows. But that's what it was famous for. And I remember saying to him at the time, I said, how can you never see any Muslims cooking or buying houses? <laughs> Muslims eat and Muslims live under a roof. How can I never see a hijabi trying to buy an apartment and something like that? Like, the subject of your reality show. That was my critique at the time. It remains the case. Obviously, we've improved vastly on both sides of the Atlantic. But for me, representation, great. You know, you can have... There's a great moment where I interviewed Ilhan Omar on MSNBC in prime time when I was sitting in for Chris Hayes, and we were talking about white supremacists. And afterwards, I just thought, what a weird moment. Two Muslims on live television, a politician and a host, we're not talking about Islamic terrorism. Great. But actually, bigger than that is just to see the rando Muslim on a game show on Jeopardy answering a question. Like, oh, yeah, Muslims aren't game shows. And I think for me, that has always been, even though I'm in the news and current affairs space, when anyone was asked me, I said, that's what we need. You don't, you don't need, I mean, it'd be great to have more of me. My wife would disagree, but I would say, it'd be great to have more people in news, but actually we need more people in the norming space, if I can call it that. So let's stay with that, the norming space. Um, I was actually talking to Neil, uh, who was at CNN, and so she came to us, she's from Afghanistan. And we were talking about this just yesterday about norming. What is there a story that, that sticks in your head as a norming story about Muslims? I'm sure several, but is there yeah. one in particular that really hits you in in a really uh, profound way, a moving way? Unfortunately, the profound moving stuff is all the bad stuff that we're back into kind of the news and current events space, which we've had a lot of bad stories about that recently. Um, I mean, look, for me, okay, let me just give you one very simple example. Right? We don't know what Stewie Husseini's religion or background is in succession. I don't think, I don't think you have to say it, maybe it's um, Do we talk about exactly? Do we, do we know about exactly this? Do you talk about no. no. Mm -hmm. So you're just indistinct, could be from... Yeah, I, I, I fought for that. Yeah. So there you go. So for me, I'm a massive Succession fan. Ariel knows this because he heard that my ringtone go off earlier. And it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's I thought he was doing me. a bit. I thought he was doing a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I only realized when the phone went off, I was like, oh, this is weird. I, I was like, are you serious? But I put this on my phone two years ago. I never thought I'd be sitting next to the guy from the show and I'd go off somebody rang me as a colleague. But for me, like, that for me is great. Like, you've got this really snarky, bit of a shitty uh, person 
in a show I love, and he's just as shitty and snarky as everyone else, and the fact that his name is Husseini is kind of by the by. It doesn't come up. And I'm glad you did that deliberately because we felt it watching it. So I think those, and you know, we talk about our favorite characters the next day at the water cooler moments, we're talking to colleagues or friends about to do one succession. No one goes, oh yeah, and the Muslim character, I don't think I've ever talked about Stewie in that context. But that's there, it's unspoken. So I think for me, that kind of stuff is exactly what we have always needed more of. I'm just going to jump in and say that's it. That, 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 that example is a, is, a, is a very small, I appreciate that example. I did fight for it, and it wasn't a fight that, that Jesse wasn't against it. But I went into his room when we were shooting the sixth episode, and I told him there are three reasons why I think this guy is an Iranian and his name should be Husseini. And I gave him the reasons. He came in, maybe they came in the 50s because they had oil money, they came in the 70s because they were rich enough to get out before the revolution, or they came after um, the revolution. I gave him all the scenarios. I told him this could happen, this could happen. And then I said, I never want to talk about this on this show. Because if we start talking about it, people will just make like, ah, oh, that's the... Middle Easterners, Muslims, Iranians, they run so much of Silicon Valley, hedge funds, I don't want to hear it. But people don't know because the capital is capital. That's what they're, they're interested in money. Well, yeah. then, then you say all that. Yes. Part of me would have liked to hear Roman comment on Vilayat and I <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell Jesse if there's anything on the cutting room floor. Yeah, I guess. Um, but really, those small moves are really all we need. Last year, Waterwell did this show um, called A Good Day to Me about this amazing Palestinian um, woman um, who is trying to have a baby at a certain age. And it's a comedy. And we were doing this show for the mere fact that it wasn't that heavy. That they, she's a regular person going through <laughs> what many women are going through in society. Immediately, kind of what happened with you when you were in the newsroom, is October 7th happens, and then all of a sudden we have, everyone's interested in our thoughts on it, our thoughts on it. No, they got you. As soon as you came. <laughs> Oh, I'm not even going to say anything. Um, but then immediately it was it was it was a conversation about um, this is not it was immediately she and I and all of us had to like comment on Israel and Palestine. And the reality is we don't live there. We're not there. We were talking about a human being just living as a regular normie. I love the word normie as a regular normie and. That, those stories are hard, but if we keep pressing those stories and keep telling them that, that this is who we actually are. We just are interested in food on the table and like getting, you know, those are the stories that we can keep pushing forward. And it's, and you know, it takes a while, but I think it, it's gonna happen, I really do. Repetition, repetition. Mine, mine is gone as well. Um, Usma, just what Ariane said about women, um, you've been really out there for quite some time. And I wonder, you know, uh, whether the experience of, of facing headwinds actually makes you more resilient or has the opposite of that. Does it get you going or does it make you pause and retreat? It, it, it does both. It does both. You know, it, like I said, in the, in, in there are times when all of us have are, are in that um, beast mode, and we're creative, and we can feel things happening, and the and the winds are behind us. And there's times where you have to be balanced, and there's times where you have to sort of contemplate and take a step back and think and re-energize yourself. And I think, in particular, um, women need to be able to um, uh, have that balance in their life. You know, and um, I think it, I think it's useful because those times when I've uh, you know, maybe after a film has come out, you know, you 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 putting your whole effort into making a film and getting it out there in the world, and then suddenly it's over, and it's done, and the you know the premiere has happened, and it's in cinemas or whatever. Then afterwards, you sort of sit with yourself and you think, wow, okay, I did this thing. It's like it's like birthing a creature almost, um, and then you sort of have to sit and and take some time and rest and, and re-energize yourself. I, I feel that I have to do that anyway, and I think I've got better at doing that. And I think also it speaks to the creative process, which needs 
nourishment as much as it needs energy and fire. So, um, yeah, it's always been both for me, and, and I, and I, but I've got a lot better at accepting and rejoicing in those periods of quiet. Mehdi, back to you. You just started uh, independent and frank journalism, your hormone. What have been the challenges and the triumphs that you've seen so far? I mean, you're, you've spent uh, your early career in corporate structures, and you made yourself known, you know, you broke through. But now you've got your own. And, it, and with the mission to do exactly what you like to do, but still challenges remain. Oh, huge challenges. Anyone who knows anything about the news media industry knows it's going through one of its worst patches uh, in January and February this year. Uh, to quote Donald Trump, there was a bloodbath uh, in the media industry. A lot of people laid off in established brands in NBC and CNN and Washington Post, but also, you know, the, the, supposedly the saviors, the upstarts, the buzzfeeds, the vices, all took a beating. And in that climate, I came along and said, I'm going to start my own media company and hire people and get investors. <laughs> it sounded a little crazy, but what we try, what we tried to do, and what's such a working so far is, we decided not to do the traditional model that is broken in so many ways, which is just try and get as many eyeballs for ads as possible, which didn't work. And if any of you followed the travails of the messenger, which a millionaire called Jimmy Finkelstein set up, hired 200, 300 quality journalists from places like CNN, The Post, gave them huge salaries, spent a lot of money and went bust within a year. And the model was, you know, click, 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 eyeballs, try and get traffic. And that doesn't work anymore for many reasons which we don't have time to get into. But what I saw was there's actually an appetite for A, an alternative to mainstream media, especially post-Gaza, where people are deeply frustrated with our broken media. Um, and separately, there is a role for people who have built a brand, who have built a following, because people are so demoralized and so distrustful of mainstream media narratives that they're not all about like the letters. They don't care about the NBC or the ABC or the CNN or the BBC. They care about the person they've seen, who they trust, and who they've invested time in over the years. So what I was able to say to people is, look, I'm setting up this company. It's not just me. I could have called it the Mandy Hustle Network, Tucker Carlson style, but I didn't, because I want to build something that endures beyond me, I hope. But, you know, I am the face of it. I brought together some great people like Naomi Klein and Greta Thunberg and Basim Yusuf and Owen Jones and Fatima Bhutto from around the world who have agreed to be contributors, and I'm very blessed to have them. But fundamentally, it was, do you trust me? Do you, have you, if those of you who followed me from the BBC to Al Jazeera to The Guardian to The Intercept to NBC, um, do you trust me to do this? And I wanted to do it because I wanted the freedom. Now, you know, now more than ever, never has freedom tasted so good. So. I was telling these guys if I get to wake up in the morning and do whatever the hell I want, whatever story I want. I don't have to worry about a phone call for anyone. I don't have to worry about you know checking with anyone. I got into a fight with Megan McCain the other day on Twitter, which don't do. And <laughs> she started like throwing all the stuff at me, like, oh you did that. And I was like, are you trying to tell on me? Like, I'm looking behind me. Who who are you complaining to? I don't have a I'm you know, fire myself uh, to quote Ariane. So it's a great feeling. But look, the challenges are massive. A, you've lost a big, easy platform in cable news. So no debate about that. It's very easy just to go into the NBC infrastructure, have that platform, that team, you know, that live uh, slot. No one's pretending otherwise. Um, and I spent my life, as you mentioned, in the warm embrace, in the, in the bosom of corporate media. I've been, I've been happily W2 my entire life. Right? I've barely been freelance. I'm not one of these journalists who've been a scrap. I've always just... Very, very lucky, gone from one job to another, got my paycheck, don't have to worry about anything, taxes taken out, all that stuff done. And that's my wife made fun of me. She was like, you're gonna run a company, you can't be. Um, and here I am now dealing with like payroll, and just before I came in to uh, DC today, I, just before I came today, DC I an email about some tax thing that you have to fill in. I was like, ah. So all that stuff is not great, I'm not good at it, it's not something I enjoy. It comes with the territory, I just need to delegate more. But the idea of having this platform in an election year, perhaps the most consequential election year of our lifetimes, in the middle of a genocide in the Middle East, uh, is actually very liberating. It feels like this is actually what I was born to do. Um, I love having a team. Um, and the creative freedom that you get is amazing. And look, to be fair, I had a lot of it at NBC. Um, uh, despite how it ended, I had a lot of creative freedom. And you talk about storytelling. I was able to use that platform to tell some big stories. 
uh, in a way that others weren't doing. And I took advantage of that for three years. Like, I treated every hour of air time. Like, I, I, look, I look at some people in our media, I think, they just wasted that whole, that whole segment. Like, I treated it, like, not religiously, but just very sacred. I'm on TV, I've got an hour, I've got this privileged platform, I'm not gonna waste a second of it. I'm gonna be very deliberate in who the guests are. I'm gonna spend a lot of time on those monologues and introductions. And, you know, I love storytelling, not in the same way uh, you guys do fiction, but for me, history, for example, is very important to me. Uh, we live in a country of amnesiacs, right? I'm sorry, United States of America, memory of a goldfish. Um, no one remembers anything. Um, and, you know, we now can't even remember what kind of president Donald Trump was. Um, it was three years ago. So, for me, history is very important. For example, when, when the U invasion of Ukraine happened, I devoted a lot of my monologues to telling stories about the Russian invasion of Afghanistan to remind people what happened there in the 80s. What was the analogies there? I told stories about uh, the long dead fascist philosopher who Putin looked to for guidance and told his life story. So for me, there's a lot of material there on American cable news and on American media in general to provide context and history. People think this C word, not that one. The other C word is a bad word, context. And in my industry, context is a really bad word. Oh, we don't have time for that. Oh, there's not a place for context. Oh, you're gonna offend people. Just do it straight, all this bullshit that you hear but actually context is key to journalism, right? You can't understand what's happening in the world unless you understand what came before it, unless you understand how it fit. So for me, all of that is important, and Zateo allows me to do that on multiple platforms. I was speaking to someone earlier who was on my MSNBC show, and I said, sorry it was so short, but that's the perils of cable. You've got someone here saying, go to ad break. Now I can do epically long podcasts, interview shows, there's no limit. So yeah, all of those things are very liberating, and freedom, that's it. freedom has never tasted so good, I'll be honest with you. It's heavy. Yeah, but I don't like doing payroll. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> I just uh, to pick up. You like many have uh, and are working in corporate structures, and you have your independent platform, the social good platform. You have the ability to touch widely through your creative work, uh, large swath people, and then perhaps more intimately. Um, but more deeply through your independent platform. Right. right? Which do you think will have the, the bigger impact? The, I am down the road. I appreciate that question. And you brought up the word context. One thing that we say at Waterwell, it's not about, we say this all the time, we'd rather have depth than breadth. We'd rather have depth of an idea and empathy about one person's life being than the breadth of trying to hit a thousand people's beings. That's not gonna, that's not real. Um, and so, like beautifully said, um, I, I believe that the reason why Waterwell was created it was not because it was an engine for me to make creative art, it was an engine for people to have way before, way after I'm dead and buried, for them to continue to do this type of you know, artist as citizen type work is what we call them. And, and the reality is, you know, we talk about this a lot. A lot of uh, filmmakers here, a lot of actors here, a lot of writers here. Um, I understand that it's important to have representation in front of the camera so that when you see, you know, me do Love Life and I have the character be Iranian or, or Stu Hussein or any of those things, that's important. But the reality is, is that we, as a group, really need to stop with these um, middlemen and gatekeepers and start owning our own platforms and making our own content and just putting it out there for them to love and enjoy. And again, you're doing journalism and it's hard hitting and really factual and also very deep. We're also, like you also said, and like you're trying to make, we're not trying to, everything has to be huge about war. I mean, we have like really silly stories that we can tell. And so the, so to answer your question, you know, a long way of answering your question is it always has to be, it always has to be about the stories that we're telling and the, and, and hopefully we as, 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 as storytellers um, can own the mechanism to put it out there instead of waiting for someone to say, oh no. The thing about the corporate structure, which is so crazy, I was just talking to um, some one of your guests here today, and you know, I've done Marvel, I was in Spider-Man, I've done really huge movies with huge budgets. 
And at the top, in all of these huge things, this, this movie I just shot, these folks are winging it. They're absolutely winging it day to day. Say what I get a lot of, say whatever you want. Say what you want. Oh, no, you don't have to say that. Don't worry about that. Well, let's change the scene. But when it comes to us, we have to do five years of development, <laughs> 10 emails about one character description line, and then it's like, I need to learn an image. No one's seen that movie. Blah, 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 blah. Well, or we could just cut all that out and just make the movie. You know, and, and that's harder, it's more difficult, it's a room for failure, it's greater. Um, and, and, but I think that is the, I, I think that is the real engine. I hope that moving forward, if you were to look back, that they, that you don't really just think about the characters that I may or may not play, but like the opportunities that Waterloo has given to a Palestinian or a veteran and an Iranian, because those, those, we're not gatekeeping anyone's storytelling if they're going to go deep and you know be you know empathetic about it. Thank you, um, Usma. Uh, picking up on, on what Ariane said, you used the word hopefully. What gives you hope? Oh gosh, um, I mean you just have to have hope. Ours is not a caravan of despair, you know. Yeah. I mean that's all really. Um, I don't know that I could point to anything specific that gives me hope, but I have, I, I, I do make it a practice to try and find it and find different ways and find solutions that make me hopeful again. I think you're exactly right, uh, Ariane, and, and in the way that Mehdi now owns his means of production, I, I've, come to the, I've come to the conclusion that that's where we need to be. And being able to put together, and I'm, I'm now, um, wanting to put together a, a fund that's, uh, that speaks to us and, and is, is able to not only back our projects but to, pick, to be able to exploit them in, from a distribution point of view as well. I really think that that's um, a, a crucial next step for our evolution, otherwise we will always be at the behest of people who will only ever want to give us some breadcrumbs. And where we're spending 85% of our energies just explaining ourselves, right. explaining our humanity, convincing them that we are human and funny and normal and weird, and all of those things. I'm just bored of that now. I don't want to do it anymore. You know, and like at the beginning of your career when you were a bit more, you were like, oh yes, you know, let's, let's make the film about the identity stuff. And I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to make the movies that I want to make. And I realized <coughs> that when you, when you, when you, once you open the curtain on how the rest of the industry works, and this, and we look at the Tribeca Film Festival, and let's talk about film for just a second. The film industry is huge. It has a very well entrenched system where doors can be opened very easily. You know, the fall guy can be made for 200 million and then marketed for 250 and be an absolute flop, and it's okay. It won't kill Ryan Gosling's career. Um, and we, we, don't, we do not have access to that because people making the decisions, we need to explain ourselves to the people making the decisions. So we don't have that shorthand. And I think I spent so much time trying to find that shorthand, trying to trojan horse it, trying to do, um, trying, to, trying to sort of trick the industry into, into telling these stories. And sometimes they've succeeded, you know. Um, but uh, I think now we in the moment calls for, the political socioeconomic moment calls for um, something more and something bigger. And in order to do that, we can't just be working at the grassroots. We do need our communities and the people who have been successful in our communities to understand that the only way things change for us, in the way they change for uh, black communities, and the way they change for the LGBT, for queer communities, is by capturing hearts and minds, is by having more influence in the culture, is by making, being in decision-making places and being able to make those decisions and being able to tick the yes, yes box. So that's kind of, kind of where I'm at for that. Thank you. I mean, it just made me think um, about, about this that we're still talking about trying to persuade 
the corporate structures in some ways. What what would it take for us to um, actually look inward into the community where we have our audience, a ready-made audience, hungry for our stories, where we don't have to prove, you know, our identity or or what we eat and, and so on, you know, the basic things. What if we turn to the community and um, produced a story willy-nilly on a small budget and then showed it on a wall and have, you know, 2,000 people come? I, I find that, not that we can live without corporate structures, that's important, that's, that's a reality, it's a, it's a practical reality. But what if we did more of that and then the corporate would come anyway? I think there's a lot of filmmakers out there that are doing that now and also the way that technology and social media has changed the, in particular, distribution landscape, you can do that now. You can self-distribute your film. You have, you have to put a hell of a lot of effort into it, but you can do it. People have done it. Um, and there are organizations that are supporting um, getting films out there that um, getting films out there that are, uh, that have community audiences within them, for sure. But I'm greedy, I want it all. You know, I want that, and I want the other stuff yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> so. And, 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 and we, we don't have to be ashamed to say that everyone else does. All the yeah. white folks want that. Yeah. I mean, they all want, they want that all. They want to own that and that and that. And, and when we say this, it feels like we're apologizing for it. I agree with you. I think you want it all, and you should have it all. You know, really. Um, I think, anyway, that's all I want to say. Great. Have you, um, along these lines, the same, um, line of, of uh, self-funding. Have you heard of a film called Manthan? Yeah. Manthan so was nice. made in India um, in the uh, realistic, neorealism movement uh, cinema in the 80s or the 90s. And it was funded, it's about the formation of a dairy cooperative for dairy farmers who, who actually have a very bad life because the middlemen uh, suck dry every penny that they make and keep them indebted to them. It's that uh, oppression. But what the farmers did is this young filmmaker named Sean Benigal, who was younger than at that point, the son of his career, he went to them and he said, I want to make this film. You are under an oppressed system. Um, could you contribute something towards the making of this film? these endless dairy farmers. Well, lo and behold, and, and there was agitation and a movement taking place within, within this one village. Um, thank you. We have a wall situation here. I think the, the wireless cuts out because of that. Um, but anyway, we mentioned that. So, so that was the story, and, and he was, he was um, onto something about, about this, this very embryonic movement. So what happened is that the farmers came in. There were hundreds of thousands of farmers. I, I could quote you the number of farmers, but they gave whatever they could. They made this film, um, and they actually overthrew the oppressive structure and they formed a film, a, a, a cooperative, a, a milk cooperative, and therefore they had more money and, and it was a more equitable situation for them, because socially and, and uh, culturally and economically, all of those things. So, that, so the reason I bring it up is that film was funded fully by these very, very poor dairy farmers. It spawned a movement in India. It spread to other dairy farm farmers, and um, and that film's now been restored. It was shown in Japan just recently, um, and it's been re-released, and um, and a lot of farmers are watching it. So what's my point here? My point is this: that I'm the producer of that film. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no, I, I, I have no state of that film at all. Um, but it just struck me as so interesting because it was so early. 
and uh, whatever it took, and of course the actors didn't take any money and so on, so that was built on, on uh, goodwill, really. Um, but it's been re-released, and in that re-release, it's reinvigorating a movement. So not only is the work that you do important creatively, but also that that creative work informs, seeds the ground for a different kind of thinking. For the future, that that was my point. Very roundabout way of, of telling the story. Um, that's why I'm not doing what you're doing. But um, that's <laughs> um, you know, there's so many examples. Try this one. Um, I think I think again, those micro stories that you're talking about are are really key. And I think I'm, you know, we're always trying to hit a home run as artists. Every single time we're trying to be like, okay, we're going to make this and this is going to be the Oscar winner. <clears throat> and the reality is, that's not necessary. It really is not necessary. We did a show, I'll give you, I, I, did, I was in this play called, uh, I was in this play called The Humans on Broadway, and it was written by half, I have three mics. <laughs> 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 did you give me three mics in succession? No. no. Did you get one today? All right. All right. Um, you're going to have this one. Uh, um, I did this show called The Humans. It was off Broadway. You know, we didn't think anything was going to happen from it. It moved to Broadway very quickly. And the writer of this was half Lebanese. And, and, the, and I was the only other in this cast of a cast of white folks. And then he said, hey, we want to make the last name um, a Lebanese last name. And, we, and he and I talked about it, and people were like, well, why do you guys want this? And we both looked at each other without even knowing. We're like, well, because if this play, which ended up winning the Tony Award for Best Play, if this play gets done, they're going to have to cast a Middle Easterner to play this part. And so all for the next two years, I would get, I would get texts from my Middle Eastern friends <laughs> being like, how did you do this character? And that, to me, that small, it's so small. But it is so huge. Me all the So anyway, that's one small example of what you're talking about. And I understand that as artists, we want to make the most impact and do the most that we can do. I get that. But sometimes it's those small things that do the most, you know, influential uh, next moves. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. And I think especially to all of the filmmakers out here, um, today, it's it feels like, oh my gosh, I've got to get all of my ideas and all of the theses that I have and I've been holding with me out into this one film. And actually, from a creative point of view as well, like the smaller and more specific you can be with your story, the more global it always is, the more universe, the more impactful it is. And, and, and that is also a discipline, and that's, that's a discipline that you have to... That is about hope, that means you know what, this is not going to be the last movie I ever make. I am going to, I, I am going to get another one made, and I am going to get another one out, and I will write another one, or whatever it is. So I, I, think, I think you're quite right to um, not think that oh, every hit has to be a home run. Just, uh, just on that, obviously I'm not coming uh, from a film background, but just on the principle behind it, especially for those of you who are in the audience who are younger, in terms of... And it's so spot on what you said about trying to get everything down. Like when I was young, I wanted to do everything all the time. And you said, we want to have it all. Of course we do. Uh, we want to be greedy. We want to get everything done. And I'm always worried about, like, shortage of time. If I don't do it now, when will I do it? Um, and actually, to go back to the fact that I'm 44 years old, I'm older than Ariana. And way older. Way older. Um, <laughs> but actually, I'm still doing stuff now for the first time. Going, wow, I did it now. For the fact I didn't do it when I was 20, it's, it's there. And I think you can get around to it. Not everything has to be done immediately. There is time to get your ducks in a row, whatever phrase you want to use, and say, okay, I'm going to do this today, but something else in a year's time will do something bigger. And I think you can plan that way. I'm not a long-term person. I don't have a Chinese Communist Party group in a while. I don't know where I'll be in five years. Uh, I couldn't have told you five years ago that I'd be around today. But I do think there's a sense of don't overdo it, right? Enjoy the moment. Focus on what you're good at now. Uh, take pleasure in the small wins, medium wins, maybe big wins that you're having right now. And the time will come for the other things. Uh, you know, uh, I, as someone who spent 15 years as a journalist watching Mark Regev, uh, spokesman for the Israeli government, kind of dodge and deflect his way through various British and American TV interviews, and I've followed Mark Regev 
since I was not even a public figure, since like the late, you know, 2006, 7, 8, 9, I used to watch John Stern interview him on Channel 4 News. And, you know, last year, I finally got an interview with Mark Rickett on my own show, uh, and I destroyed him. And uh, it was great. And I was like, yeah, I waited a long time for that. <laughs> it was worth it. I didn't, I didn't need to do it 10 years ago. Um, if you had said my show was cancelled, no, that's nothing to do with it, of course. Um, but it was a great interview. And my point being to bring that up is there's still moments where you're thinking, oh, this is something I'd love to do 15 years ago, but actually it's fine, I'm doing it now, it's actually better I'm doing it yeah, now. Yeah. And I think that applies whether you're in news, whether you're in the arts, uh, across the board. There's a lot we want to do, and that's a good thing. It doesn't mean we can do it all. Uh, and in fact, I launched a company two months ago, and we're just overwhelmed because there's just too much to do. There's just some, you know, somebody said, you should take a pause. And I was like, I wish we could take a pause, but there's just too much going on. I want to pitch you a project later now. <laughs> <laughs> Are you? Oh, uh, awesome. no. Either one. I was, I was just going to say about, I, I really feel that way about my last feature film, Creature, which is essentially a dance film. Akram Khan, if you know him, is an incredible Bangladeshi uh, Kadak dancer. Um, and uh, it, it, I, I made this film with Asim Kapadia over the pandemic in 10 days under much duress when we hadn't seen people. And, and it's a beautiful, beautiful, just pure art film. And it was so freeing to make something that wasn't about identity, wasn't explaining myself, wasn't about a brown woman who does something or whatever, or omni or whatever it is that they want me to make movies about. Um, and I think, um, I think it's really important to also, in your own creative journey, allow yourself to uh, really think about how you define your own expectations and the expect expectations put on you because um, that's where you find the gold, that's where you find the, the good work, and that's where you find that longevity to keep going in, like a, in a long-term career. Can I borrow one of the videos? Yes. Um, I was going to say one thing, just so we don't lean all the way in one direction, which is, so you mentioned right at the beginning, which is, how have we taken advantage of our difference? And I, it would be completely disingenuous for me to sit here and say, I'd have the same career path if I was a white Christian or atheist person, not from immigrant parents in the UK, not an immigrant in the US. I do think I have used that to my advantage, for sure. And why not? Because everything else is loaded against me. Um, there have been moments where, yes, I've taken advantage of that, that somebody wanted a person who looked like me or sounded like me on a particular topic, segment show. And I don't think we should be, A, be ashamed of that, embarrassed about it, nor should we run away from that. As, as I mean, I said the other day, like, the white folks do it, they would do it. I think that applies to the brown and black folks and, and, and every other colour you are. I, I, just, I just want to remind you all, especially those of you in the creative spaces, which is, Obviously, it's annoying for people to be saying, like, you just made me laugh, you said, the honor killing movie, you know, that was a big, you know, for, the whole period, the whole genre, the whole, genre, yeah, the whole period genre. of modern British history when that was the only story in the news. Yes. Um, and uh, then it was grooming names. Um, but on the one hand, there's that. On the other hand, actually, and I, I've just spoken to a bunch of you beforehand, and you are making brilliant stuff about stuff that affects our communities and people who look like us. And there's something to be embarrassed about or ashamed of. That's something we should celebrate. And we should celebrate the fact that we're making those things, yeah. not the folks who don't understand that world yeah. at all. Yes, 100%. It, and it is that celebration of difference that we've been taught and perhaps conditioned to think is something bad or wrong or something that needs to be assimilated. It does not. It absolutely does not. Honestly, for all of our cultures, take a lesson from us too. I mean, we are kind, considerate, compassionate people. And like sometimes just that is jarring enough. So, you know, as they say, you know, existence sometimes is the resistance, but we have to do, now we're at a place right now that we just have to keep moving forward, forward. Fantastic. I think this is the moment to turn to uh, the audience and see if you have any questions. We have two mics. Oh, that, that makes a difference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do we. We've got four. Yes, we've got, I've got two. Hello, the audience of creators not singing. No one's got first question. <laughs> <laughs> no questions. Here, here. Hi, hi. Um, so, um, as, as your senior, you're slightly younger than the older of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm curious how you feel about this, but I think um, this was touched upon, this idea that 
we grew up in a different world. Um, I think a lot of us who are on the skater side now are Gen Xers, and we sort of had both of our feet you know, in, in the before world and the after world. And I, every day, I ask myself, how am I supposed to understand this mobile first generation? who's fundamentally in a world that is um, homogenized and the inside is homogenizing and the inside. They're living in spaces of standardization and homogenization. Their windows are Instagram and Facebook. They all look out the same world. They are replying to the same prompts, existing in the same environments, and yet they're so proud of their differences. Where we grew up in a, in a completely complex, diverse world at home, and then we came to an environment where we were forced to imagine. We were asked, look like everybody else, behave like everybody else, learn to speak the language quickly before uh, you, know, you get bullied at school, etc. And this, he said, huge difference between my generation, and I assume a lot of your generations, and the generation who was born in this world of post, you know, mobile first world, where the entire, entire existence is on their phones and through social media, etc. And so how can we talk from a place of confidence and to give advice to a generation that we fundamentally so little understand so little about in a world that confuses all of us? Let's admit that we live in a world in which we all have our opinions. But there's a lot of humility that needs to come with our opinion because there's so much that we don't understand we can't figure out. And I think that's uh, and I'm just really curious about how you guys are grappling with that reality and how do you try to work yourself. If I may, it's a, it's a really interesting point, and I, you know, I'd love to be flippant and say, oh, we don't have to worry about Gen Z, but I, I, I don't think that's true. I, but what I don't think we need to do is try to understand them um, from a from a place of patronage. All we really need to do is let them do their thing and make sure that we don't pull up the ladder behind us the way that the generation before us did. You know, so they they have they do have more knowledge of of the world as it currently is than than we do perhaps. So we have we have a hindsight and we have wisdom and we have an understanding of you'll get to a point and all of this will stop. Um, but I, I think it's our duty to help guide and help provide space and help push and keep that wedge that door open in a way that it wasn't wedged for us and I, I, I think that's the most that I feel that I'm, I'm capable of with this new generation. So I, I would push back a little bit on your premise, the idea that the world was more you know, complicated, less homogenized. I mean, I grew up in the UK with Buzma, where we had four channels, and then we had like a fifth television channel, we got lucky in our teenage years. Um, that there was not much choice on television, there was not much choice in the cinema. Uh, we didn't have a way of connecting with the outside world unless you shouted really loudly on the phone to your relatives in India, or you flew, physically had to fly there. Um, right now, like, my kids are connected in ways that we were never connected. And it's funny because you read stories about epidemic of loneliness and children being lonely and, and you know, online friendship not being real. I, I'm not disputing any of that. But on the other hand, I do think, again, that's something that we lead too much into the negative. When I was growing up, what loneliness meant was I was in a school full of white kids and no one else knew anything about my experience. There's no way of even conveying that. But I'm not going to bring in the Encyclopedia Britannica, right, to read to them the chapter on Islam or Palestine or whatever it is. Uh, today it's just a different world of understanding. You can get solidarity and connectivity uh, with millions of people around the world. Forget the rest of the people in your school and community and neighborhood. So I think in that sense they are blessed, or you are blessed, those of you are younger, in, in the crowd. I think when you said about in terms of communicating, well, let's not get into personal stuff, I'm the father of two daughters, I'm still struggling with that anyways. But professionally, what I tried, what Uzma said earlier on nailed it, which is kind of strategy and resilience, right? And that for me is absolutely key. Whenever I speak to any kind of young crowd, especially Muslim crowds, especially people who work in the media, it is that. Number one, you, know, you need to have a thick skin because you're going to get hit hard and there's going to be moments where you get fired, you get doxxed, you get bullied, you get uh, abused. That's happened to me in spades and droves over the years in multiple countries. Um, and I've had to deal with it in, in different times. Sometimes I've dealt well with it, sometimes I've dealt badly with it. And then the other thing is strategizing. Like we don't really have a strategy. To go back to my point earlier, we don't think long term. We think about just what's happening next week, next month, tomorrow. Um, and I try and, you know, I want uh, people who look like me and sound like me who want to follow in my career path to think, to think strategically in a way that I didn't. 
because I'm under no illusion that I'm the product of you know, many bits of accidental fortune, luck, timing, my mother's prayers, and a mixture of other things. Um, but it's not really a strategy. I wouldn't ever go to someone and say, hey, my career path is something that you should model. It's not, it's insane. But, uh, but, but the reality, we do need to think strategically, and all of you in this room, that's why it's good to come to panels like this and be with each other, because there is value in all speaking together and seeing how everyone else is doing it, and what the common challenges are, what the different challenges are. I think it's, as, as was said, it's not about you know, patronage, it's not about looking down on people or trying to lecture people, but more understanding where everyone else is coming from and what paths they've walked on, whether they are young or old. And I think mean, my young people have done more in their young lives than I've done in my 44 years. So in that sense, social media and, and the world we live in is actually accelerating our careers. Like, I was not a public figure until the age of 29, right? So I spent the first eight, nine years of my career just toiling away, no one had a clue who I was, I was working behind the scenes in various things, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, so, and now I see people who are like, you know, eight, 19 years old and have a million TikTok followers and are influencing the Middle East geopolitical debate. Um, so in that sense, it's also accelerating people's experiences. And that's why I think it's mutual. I think the wisdom goes both ways in many ways. But the strategy and the resilience, yeah, that is something that us older folks can definitely impart to the younger folks for sure. And stress the importance. They said everything so beautifully. I would just add, be open. I mean, we don't have all the answers. So yes. just, you know, listen. You know, I listen. Sometimes learning from them is, you know, some of the best journalists that are happening right now in war zones are children. Mm -hmm. And we're learning from them. And we're watching them and learning how, you know, so a lot of it is just, you know, maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's a Middle Eastern thing, maybe it's a Muslim thing, but we don't have to like our families did prior to us. Mm -hmm. Like say like, well, this is the way that it has to be. Mm -hmm. No, we can listen to them and be like, oh, that's interesting. That's a great way of thinking about the world. And you know, it's difficult because it doesn't mean that they have all the answers either. You know, the, the, the words I don't know are really like powerful, meaningful words. And so um, when you look, when I look at, you know, we, like I said, Waterloo runs a school in which we have grade six through 12. Mm -hmm. and, so much of what's happening is changing every single day, and every year where we, we, we have new lingo that we have to learn. But instead of being like, that's not how it's done, how our generation was taught to us. That's not how English is, that's not, we listen and we adapt and we take their, their best ofs and we take our best ofs and we make a, a, um, a really like, a community really. That's really the hope. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I've actually really enjoyed this panel. I feel like it's hard to enjoy panels. But, um... <laughs> I'm glad you're saying that at the end of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I really enjoyed listening to all of you. Thank you for your time and for the curation and for the wisdom. I have a question about like honesty in both like, I'll frame it in a film way, and then I'll also frame it in a journalism way for uh, Matthew, because I'm, I'm curious about both. But I think, you know, the film world, film is a collaboration, you know, it's not, it's not like writing a novel or like other things which, which are collaborative in some respects. So you can't always do exactly what you want to do. And whether you're an actor, whether you're a producer, whether you're a writer, director, I mean, unless you're wearing all those hats, like, they're... You have to sort of like decide what your red lines and what your boundaries are, and whether that's you know I'm not going to take terrorist roles, or I'm not going to work on a project that like does A, B, and C. But how far do you think it's reasonable to take that? Because I, I feel as though there's you know there's a sort of fine line between being strategic and being like. A pain and just being like, oh no, like I'll I'll only work on this like one specific thing, or I I sort of refuse to be in the room unless like all my criteria are being met or or whatever. So how does that factor into your decision making process on like film and television projects? And then for you, like as a journalist, I mean, you've been like you've been canceled for things that you know are pretty like far from like I feel like the reality of what some people would want you to say or perhaps things you actually feel or actually want to say on air. 
how do you decide where that line is where it's like you're going to be strategic and you're going to work within the system and you're going to like sit, you know, you're going to accept definitions for things that maybe you don't agree with, but also like you have a sort of long term vision. Like how do you navigate all these thoughts in a in a corporate system that sort of builds to keep people out with certain views? Okay. Who wants to take this? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, I can only speak for myself. I can't make a, a general rule, but it's always been a tricky one. Um, it's, a green light. it's okay. Okay. Um, it's always been a tricky path to walk. And you know, I've spoken in front of many audiences. I mentioned a moment ago on both sides of the Atlantic, where you know, people ask me similar questions. And you know, I, one of the things that's been difficult. I don't want to do a kind of you know, woe is me, but you do get stuck in a position where you're attacked from multiple sides. I've spent many days of my career being attacked from two opposite directions at the same time, and you kind of have to laugh about it. Go, All right, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a Zionist set-up student and a Hamas apologist on the same day. <laughs> Great, how did I navigate that one? Uh, but you get that a lot in the social media age, and you get a thick skin, and you get used to it. Um, uh, but the bigger question is, what are your own goals? And what are you willing to sacrifice? And when I say sacrifice, I don't mean sell out. I mean uh, make a strategic choice to not fight that battle that day. And I've tried to say this to colleagues of mine who've also worked in corporate media, which is, you know, when you say something like, for example, how you're playing the game, um, and sometimes it is a game, and sometimes you play it, and sometimes you win, and sometimes you lose. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here. I don't think there's a black or white approach or a prescriptive approach I can give. I think, again, it comes back to what is your strategy and what is your long-term aim, and what are you willing to put up with? I have my red lines. Uh, you know, tomorrow, Fox News could offer me a $10 million a year anchor game. I'm not going to take it. I'm never going to Fox News. I'm never going to be as a guest on Fox I've turned out, because just like, oh, that's my red line. I have many red lines, and that's one of them. But, you know, other things I have done, which other people, you know, I've done Piers Morgan, which people get upset. Why are you going Piers Morgan? Um, so there's a, there's a balancing act. And I can't pretend that it's always consistent, but it is based on, in the moment, what is the right course of action, both for me, for people who maybe look to me for guidance or as a role model, whether I like it or not, uh, and trying to figure out what is the right way forward. We live in an age where everyone's always questioning each other's intentions and motives, which is a separate discussion. That's very frustrating. But you just have to work out what you want to do. So for example, I left NSNBC, right? But Eamon Moyadine and Ali Velshi and Joy Reid and Chris Hayes, all very good friends of mine, all very progressive hosts, at the network, like, I don't want them to quit. I want them to stay and do the great journalism that they're doing at MSNBC. And that involves sacrifices on their part, like for anyone else. No one in any organization gets to say whatever they want. Um, I do in mine now, because I'm a benevolent dictator. <laughs> but, but, but that's one of the advantages. Uh, but the point, off the net. yeah, it's it it true, it's true. Dictate for a day, I think Donald Trump called himself. Um, but the, the point is, that's just a reality, and that's not even a media thing. I, you know, I made a joke about being an accountant. I'm sure many accountants who want to say stuff they can't say in their accountancy firms. So those are the sacrifices we have to make. Obviously, in the media, it's a, you're doing it publicly. So people are paying attention and saying, well, did Manny bite his tongue there? Did Manny pull a punch there? Did Manny say something he doesn't quite believe? And those debates go on and on behind the scenes and publicly. But as I say, there is no right answer. But of course you have to make them. I'm not going to lie to this crowd. You said honesty. Yeah. You want to work in corporate media? You want to work in Hollywood? You want to work at NBC? You want to work at Al Jazeera? Uh, there are certain times you're going to have to hold back. That's just the reality. And the question is, how much do you hold back? On what do you hold back? And what are you gaining from holding back? those kind of choices as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, specifically, if you're talking about film, I think, uh, for me, I've always hidden and found strength in talking specifically about story. So you may have lots of reasons why you're doing a particular stories, and there's, like I said, there's like thematic reasons and political reasons and all the rest of it, or, uh, you know, a personal story that you want to get out. But if, if you are being... Um, if, if you're being mindful of your story structure and you're being mindful of the audience and, and how you're going to attract that audience and you can talk, talk to that in a, in a cogent and rational way, then it, it's really difficult to argue with rather than, oh, I just think this story needs to be told. Well, I don't really care about that, actually. I mean, regardless, even as a producer, I don't care about that. I want to know what your specific story is and how you're structuring it. And just to give a small example, um, I recently got sent a script that was, you know, it was a horror film script, 
uh, called the Palestinian Get Out. Uh, you know, it was, it was billed as, as the Palestinian Get Out, and I thought, oh my goodness, am I even ready to read this? And I read this script, and it it confused Jordan Peele's absolute magnus opus, which talks about so many things in the black struggle and all the rest of it, within a very specific structure of someone who really understands how horror tropes and horror films work, and someone who's a student of those films, and where you can point to every single creative decision he's made and said, right, I understand that from a horror context, and yes, it's great, it's all with the social commentary on top. It, it was, it approached it in a way that I've got all of this stuff to tell, and I'm just going to sort of say it's a horror film. So. So, you know, so you, you have to first and foremost be uh, um, uh, a slave to the story, and then you can build other things into and on top of that. Um, because because we, we are in the world of fiction if you're working in film and, and, and not fashion. <laughs> Aria, anything further? Yeah, I just, I think, truthfully, someone that asks that question probably knows when that moment happens what the truth is and what you should do. And just trust your gut on that. You're not gonna be wrong about that. I would say like it's really tricky. Sometimes you might be on the wrong side of things, sometimes you might be the right side of things. But what you know to be true and factual and right for you, that I think is, is, is plenty. Um, you wanna say something? I wanted to ask an And then the second thing I wanna say is that um, August Wilson is this amazing playwright who wrote Pencil. And August Wilson has these three pillars of, um, of what makes great art. And I think that's the thing that I always use in my brain, which is all great art is, has, uh, is interpersonal, Romeo and Juliet. It's global, the Montagues hate the Capulets, uh, you know, black, white, uh, all these sort of Democrat, Republican, you know, the global of it all. And third, and the thing that most people are scared of, but I think is the most powerful, is the spiritual. How, so in Romeo and Juliet, it's not. It's about how far do we go for love, you know? And sometimes that little idea that's in the brain kind of like sets aside all these other things. And if I feel like they're running on those three cylinders, I will kind of like go towards it. I just wanted to add one thing just to go back to your question about, you know, I talked about red lines. I will say this, because it would be weird not to say this in this moment, which is we are in the midst of one of the great moral issues of our moment, of our lifetimes, which is Gaza. And for me, I do believe that is a red line for a lot of people. It's a rightful red line for a lot of people. And I have been publicly and truly disappointed in how many of my colleagues have not said or done anything about Gaza, have stayed quiet, uh, have taken the easy road. And I think history will judge a lot of people in my industry for doing that, and I think that there are moments in time where there isn't a debate, where there doesn't need to be a kind of strategy, but strategy is just, there's no other way. This, is, this has to be the right thing to do. And I think a lot of people have paid a lot of prices for that, but the people who have, I think history will judge them correctly. And I would just say, since we're sitting here, and Hollywood is such a horrible place when it comes to this one issue, I think we should all give a round of applause to Ariane for signing an artist for ceasefire. I don't know if I know a lot of people yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank, you. thank you all for honestly just doing all the work that you're doing. It feels so silly that we are in a place in our lives where that is the minimum. Um, thank, you. thank you. I think uh, what we can do now is break for afternoon tea and more nibbles from Anun tea, coffee. Um, it's a reception. We'll come down if we have time and talk to you further and talk to each other. Um, so thank you very much for listening. <laughs>